on this side of the hallway is um, uh, a poet, interior designer on this side, uh, another artist and landscape architect here, uh, Eldo's place and other paintings of the mural guy's place, as well as Ben Barnhart, he's a photographer. Most of my work comes out of my shop. We're taking a stroll down the hallway towards my shop. Uh, comes out of my shop and it goes right into his photo studio and gets photographed for uh, the internet website. Um, the, the, uh, the owner of the facility here, the complex, is generous. All of the kind of public space to be used for artwork. And so I display my chairs, some of my chairs here. Um, as you can see, we've got a rocker. And, and pretty much I do sculpted Malik inspired type work. Um, but I, I do other, other chairs, but that's kind of the money maker for me. And um, we've got a uh, couple of rocking chairs down there, benches, and I make benches for this guy that paints them and they're kind of reflective of the paintings. I took a class with Peter Dolbert, if you know Peter, up in uh, Rollinsford, New Hampshire. Um, on uh, uh, Windsor type chairs. This was a log, and an oak log, and six days later it became that chair. <laughs> quite, wow. quite impressive. And if you ever get a chance to class with him, I highly recommend it. So we've got more chairs, more paintings, and uh, we're heading to the shop. Oh, maybe we do a little shop tour. Um, uh, I. I, I prefer to use old style vintage type machines. I like cast iron. I like the weight of them. Um, I don't like plastic. I don't like <laughs> aluminum, <laughs> extruded aluminum type stuff. So you'll see that uh, we've got quite, quite an array of uh, three phase cast iron machines. Okay. So um, I was a merchant marine, sailed for a bit, and uh, came ashore and worked for a power company about 32 years. And four years ago, coming up on four years, I retired. I've always been a flat board type woodworker, make casework and bookcases and tools and whatnot. And I think on the first day of my retirement, I was bored out of my gourd. And on the second day of retirement, I decided to open up a book that my mom gave me probably 15 years earlier. And it was uh, Sam Maloup's book on how he makes furniture. And that's how this whole thing started. Over the years, I've collected some uh, nice vintage machinery and restored it. Um, if we walk around the shop, can we do that? Yeah. Walk around the shop and uh, look at some of the machinery. We've got a 12-inch uh, uh, Northfield um, HD uh, jointer. Uh, I think I paid 600 bucks for that. Wow. So, and restored it. I bought it from a guy in Littleton, New Hampshire. I also had this uh, uh, 32 inch Northfield um, uh, bandsaw that I bought from uh, a company that went out of business in uh, cabinet maker that went out of business in Brooklyn maybe three or four years ago. And it was in pretty tough shape, but the folks at Northfield helped me out. I mean, I'd even bought them the safety tags and everything and <laughs> put them back on it, you know. They'd completely been, you know, taken down to nuts and bolts and sandblasted and whatnot and restored new tires. I think that, that uh, bandsaw, if you were to buy it today and it's still available, it goes for uh, somewhere north of 16,000 bucks. Oh, wow. And I think I paid well, maybe fifteen hundred dollars for it. You know? <laughs> so that's that's kind of my game as I buy these machines, these cast iron machines, old vintage machines that people can't get rid of because they're so heavy mm. and, and do something with it. Got a twenty inch uh, Oliver uh, planer, and uh, this is this is kind of like the prize of the of the collection. This is a pre nineteen oh five Oliver didn't um, keep uh, records prior to 1905. So I know that it's pre-1905. There's only a handful of these left in the world. And it's a uh, um, number three Oliver miter trimmer. So you use the ship's wheel to trim uh, angle like if you were doing picture prints. 
I don't use it all that often, but it's a novelty thing. Back when uh, my friends and I were smoking cigars, we used to trim the ends of our smart <laughs> cigars with it. But other than that, you know, it's, it's kind of a novelty item. Got some um, state, uh, this sander, coin assist sander, uh, on a spindle sander, and I use these quite extensively on uh, Juana, and I'll show you later how I do that. So the bandsaw, got a couple of lathes. Um, this is a monster lathe, uh, uh, Oliver 25C. Um, I think it's a uh, eight foot bed, does a 20 inch swing. And then I have an Oliver um, spindle sand, a uh, spindle lathe that, um, but that, uh, very short spindles, um, 1926, I haven't refurbished it. I bought this thinking that I couldn't get this into the shop because it's on the second floor. We actually flew the bed in through the windows in order to get it into the shop. And then we have all the lathe tools and all of this. This has uh, been converted over to, uh, the, big, the big lathe has been converted over to um, variable speed drive through a fall door. Um, variable speed drive unit. We've got um, a couple of benches. Uh, um, this bench I'm thinking replaced with a, a Rabot um, split top bench, uh, bench craft type bench with bench craft hardware. I had the hardware, but I repurchased the wood and put that in. The purpose for replacing the bench is that I'm hoping uh, that in the fall, uh, in order to complement paying the rent here is to teach some classes. And I've actually had a lot of women that want to get into woodworking that have asked me to teach women only classes. So that's kind of a concept. But I need more bench space in order for everybody to have some place to do their work. Got racks for, um, uh, for uh, various clamps. This is an interesting machine if you haven't seen this before. It's a uh, hand glider. It was made for uh, the paper print interest industry a long time ago, and um, it has a, a very small blade, uh, and it's it's quite interesting. This blade is actually threaded. The arbor is threaded into the blade. There's no nut that holds the blade onto it. So um, I use this for a lot of precision joinery, and we'll see that we'll see that later. Um, I keep all my templates. You see in a lot of chair makers and woodworkers, they make their uh, uh, templates and they hang them from the ceiling and everything. And I thought <laughs> that would clutter, like clutter, so I, I keep them out. Here's an interesting machine, 1940 vintage um, um, radio drill. So it actually angles uh, this way, if you can see that, and it angles this way, and it's great for spindle work. Here's a Here's a blank for a, uh, a stool. I probably won't do this, but I could angle this so that I could cut the legs, drill the holes for the legs, and then taper them with a reamer. And then this, this particular um, stool is going to have a backrest with some spindles coming up to go to the backrest. And I'm waiting for the reamer. I've ordered the reamer, and I don't have that on site yet. But and um, what else do we have? The assembly table. This is kind of the Rabot uh, bench assembly table. This wood was a little on the green side and it's shrunk, so I need to true that up. But um, believe it or not, I do a lot of joinery work with this right here. <laughs> and we'll see how that happens uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Not a big fan of. Um, uh, shapers, I, they kind of scare me. I had a shaper. Uh, it's uh, kind of five horsepower. The arbor was uh, one and three quarters inch. Cost more money for the for the uh, the actual bits than it for the shaper. <laughs> you know, <laughs> one of those deals, and that it, it was it ran at something like I don't know seventeen thousand RPM or something. It scared me. I do use a router table um, for for some of the joinery on the move chairs. Luke inspired chairs, and I'll show you that as well. Um, what I what I do with that, but um, um, I'm not a big fan of shapers. Yeah. So um, this is this is the chair that I'm gonna kind of go through the steps of making it. 
it's over it's over <laughs> Brian's walking around with a phone in his hand, a computer in his hand, a tripod. So, so this is the chair. And there's a little bit of a story behind us. So the reason that I decided to make a cherry uh, chair to to you folks from the process that I used to do that. Um, I went to a show and I didn't have enough um, chairs to put in the show, so I took one of my wife's dining room chairs to the show and I sold it. <laughs> so she's minus one chair. So this uh, this is one of her dining room chairs, and this is what it looks like somewhat assembled. So um, My shop's fairly small, so I use my um, table saw, my band saw, anything with a big table on the I use it as a, a working table. And it's, you can see that I, I put on my AstroTurk. Perfect. All right. I want to show you something that's kind of important here when you do this. These legs, when we put them on and off the chair, assemble, disassemble, tire, disassemble. Um, it's because the joiner is fairly tight, there's an opportunity to uh, chip out the wood. So what I do is I grab the bottom of the leg and soft part of the hand and take it out evenly. If you take it out at an angle or an angle like this, you're liable to ruin your seat material or your leg material. That, I, I learned that lesson pretty quickly, <laughs> ruining a few legs. So we'll get the other leg off and then uh, talk about the... Um... So I'm literally pulling here. So this panel is um, fly assembled. I partially bandsaw sculpted a half of it. And we'll do the other half uh, live here, hopefully. If we still have a live. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, looks like it. So, um, to start with, we need um, five pieces of wood, uh, four square. What I do is uh, 22 inches and uh, four and a quarter inches. And I use biscuits. Now, a lot of folks are moving on to um, Festool Domino, but I find that biscuits are much better, and th this is the reason why. When, when I, um, and we'll talk about this in a second, um, cut these after I four squared them four and a quarter inches by 22, is it 22? It might be 20. Let me just see. Going on memory here, so not to be it's usually the seat to 20, 20 by 22 or 20 by 20. So, so that's 21 inches. And once it's cooked, it'll be less. Inches, yeah, 20, 22 inches. When, when, after it's four squared, I cut a bevel on these to make it cooper. And the bevel is such that if you can see these marks, the center one here, here, three degrees cut, here, here, three degrees cut, three degrees cut. And the resultant is that you have a cooper, I'm over exaggerating this, uh, seat. Everybody following that or want more explanation? Because I can, I can explain further with the drawing if necessary. Everybody sounds yeah. good? Yeah. Okay. So, um, this, this angle, before I sculpted this, is an acute angle, and I can't get a good mark in there. And, and I also can't get a good, this is uh, acute, and I can't get a good domino cut here. 
So I use biscuits. The biscuit are, for me is better on acute angles where the domino is good on obtuse angles. And uh, therefore I use biscuits. Now you can see this line here and you can see where the biscuit is. I'm on the low side, I'm up a half an inch or so. I scribe a line a quarter of an inch and my Makita biscuiter, the bottom of the, the biscuiter fits in that groove. I rotate it up and, and then hmm. cut the biscuit. Where the domino, the positioning of it is much more difficult. So that's why I use biscuits. Once I cut those angles, and I want to I show you really quickly on how I do that. My guess is that you guys are far more talented woodworkers than me. <laughs> <laughs> Doubt that. <laughs> but, uh, but Some are. I, Maybe, I, just, but I just purchased this not me. like two months ago, one of these little guys here, an angler, and a digital angle cutter. I put it on my table saw, I zero it, I put it on my blade, and I turn this to three degrees hot center or 87 degrees. Now this, this blade, this table saw, the blade goes in this direction. As some, you know, they go in the opposite. Most now today go in the opposite direction. So it makes this a little more dangerous, but this is like 1945 vintage. So I use this. Now this table is a sliding table. So I don't, this, this portion of the table slides so I don't use this as my zero reference point, I use this one because I'm cutting on this side. When I cut these angles, this one only gets one cut on one side, three degrees in this direction, over exaggerating. But this one gets three degrees in this direction and three degrees in this direction. This one gets two, and this one gets two cuts, and this one gets one. So what I do is I cut, I set my, my um, blade at three degrees and I cut the bottom of this at three degrees so that it's just touching the bottom. It's cutting, I'm backwards here. I'm just cutting the bottom of this, it's touching the tip of the blade and I'm cutting this direction. And I do all of them in that direction. Then when I have to do the second one, because it's thinner, the board is now thinner, the stock is now thinner, I have to move my fence. And that's the reason for going one and a quarter inches wide for each piece. For following that. So the result on this one, I think we measured it earlier and it came up to 20 and a half inches. And if I wanted to make six chairs at 20 inches, I need to trim them somehow or another. So they were, and I would only trim the outside. So I cut the outside of them to make it so that when it's temporarily or dry fitted jointed, that it's 20 inches. Now, my wife's chair, uh, 20 inches. So that's why I'm doing this one. That's why I'm, I'm making this up. So once we have that all done, we want to go to the joinery of the legs. And this is like the most crucial thing. This joint, we want to have um, this thickness tight to this opening so that it, it's not sloppy. I mean, we don't want it to be, you know, you gotta pound the shit out of it to get it in there. We want it to be tight, snug. Um, so what I use is a vernier calipers. And if, you, if there's anybody out there that made one, you can know that this is kind of a trick to make this right. <laughs> so um, I will cut, this dado on my Hammond glider, this dado here, and then I will, on my router cable, I will route this slot, half inch slot, on the top and the bottom, and then the dado on the leg is measured 
by this thickness. Not a ruler, but by that. And so I think this is 18 inches from here to that dado mark. I will put this 18 inches here and I mark that. Prick it. And then I scribe around it. And then when it's square, this one's already been sculpted. When it's square like this, I run it over to the Hammond saw and I cut these, this dado, all of that on the sliding tool. Now, you can do this, you can do this on a, on a sled, on a table saw. Um, what I suggest when, when I do it on the Hammond saw, the sliding saw, what I suggest is that you cut, you cut one side, And then you go all the way across, and then you know I can't do a dado. That's why I don't do this. I can't use a dado blade on this saw. This um, doesn't have. Uh, but but in in any event, um, I'll cut one side, cut the other, and then plow out the middle. Then what I do is I rotate this, and if it was flat on the table with the blade running, I push this over until I get a sound that it's making a cut. And then I plow through that. I do the same on the opposite side. I go, and the, that way you don't have a big ridge right here that affects the joint. You follow, follow that logic? Yeah. That's how I do that. So, um, but do the seat first, measure this, mark this. Once you mark the bottom for this one, transfer that mark over to the one on the other side, the bottom of it. So this is the same line. It doesn't really matter what the top is, and then do this, do the same. You know, you ascribe the mark around this, and then plow out the material based on the thickness of this side. You know, don't there's there's the joinery is specific to each joint. You can't you can't say, oh, you know what? I made two left legs. Let me see if I can fix this and make two right <laughs> legs or two two right. You know, change it. It doesn't happen. In fact. When I'm doing a commission, I make a spare one, just in case. <laughs> and so I've got a spare back leg, I got a spare front leg. These will <laughs> never be used on any other chair. I can't use them now. I can't, I can't, I mean, if I worked hard, maybe I could, but it's, it's too much work. I can't make this gap to be perfect to that. And the reason being is, is that our preferred stock level thickness is four quarter, uh, excuse me, eight quarter. Now, I go to the timber store and I buy rough stock and I look at it and I measure it. You know, its thickness is good. By the time I get it through the planer, it's not quite eight quarter. It's like one and 15 sixteenths. Well, that impacts this thickness for this joint. So, you know, it's not like you can make 20 legs and hope that they can fit on a seat joint. Uh, all that. Yep. All right, so um, at this point, what I typically do is I have my middle template. And if, if you guys want, at some point, I can mark out all these templates and make them for you. You know, that's, um, I don't like to say that publicly because I actually paid for these. So. But in any event, so I marked the center board, center timber, with this template. Both sides. Ready to move? Sure. We'll go over the band side. <laughs> the best spot to set this up is.
I make sure that my blade is pretty square. This is always subjective, I guess. It's pretty square. And then I put my digital. zero it. And because I have three degrees cut on this edge, where are we? Just <laughs> edge, three degrees, three degrees, I adjust my bandsaw so that it's three degrees. And then what I do is I cut out the bowl of the seat, the bowl of the saddle. It should be close to the same thickness on this side, this side. But I only do from nine inches back because I want this to be the pommel. Okay, I hope everybody's following that. So I band saw this here, and then I cut from here to the center line of the board. And this is this is a tricky cut because I'm riding on the edge of the bevel. So I'm cutting this, and this this is a tricky cut because you're riding just one. You're not on a flat surface; you're on an edge, and then you want to do the other side. And, uh, and this is roughly seven to nine inches. It's going to be it's going to be sculpted afterwards. Ready to move? Sure. Let's go back to the table spot. I hope I hope this is helpful. I hope this encourages people to be. Uh, take this challenge on and build a sculpted chair because, quite frankly, um, Sam Malut's design for sculpted chairs is very forgiving. Mm. You know, it's much more forgiving than flat surface joinery, like mortise and tenon. Um, you know, sculpting is, uh, uh, it, it, you shouldn't be intimidated by it, I, just, I guess what I'm saying. So, um, now we've got this sculpted out, and this, this here, the way it's cut, three degrees this way, and and, and if you notice, I always number these, like two front, which angle I'm going to cut that at, one front, which angle I'm going to cut that at. It can get confusing and you can mess up things in a heartbeat. So now that I have this, when I put these together to make the coopered seat, the cup seat, these, this angle here is an acute angle. And to mark that accurately, we took a pencil and we marked that because we use this centerpiece as the template for the next piece over. There is no, there is no template for that. Mm -hmm. So we want to use that, that piece. And, and if you, um, there's, it's tough to mark that. And everybody and their brothers come up with the, the you know, saying that they came up with the solution to do this. It is kind of ingenious, but um, I think Sam came up with it himself. <laughs> so um, this board is going to be exactly the same as that board. And if we swap these, take number two, put it over to number four. Or, and we mark it, it's now an obtuse angle. All of that. Hmm. And we take number four oh, okay. and we yeah. put it over here and we mark it because they're going to be the same. You want them to be identical when you find this. So I've already carved this one out with the bandsaw. And what we'll do is um, let's mark this one and we'll fire up the bandsaw and cut it. Awesome. Okay? Yeah. All right. You get something to mark your way. I like to use a good new sharp. Um, and I, I'm not I'm not uh, adverse to um, using um, indelible ink as you can see <laughs> on this. <laughs> These are sculpted. This is gonna all go away when you when yeah. you sculpt. So um just orientate myself. This is number four. This is number two. We have number two on the side. I'm just mark it. Because these these angles on the flat surface complement each other. You follow that? 
Now, there's a concern here, and that is, is that if we bandsaw this at, we're going to adjust the, remember, remind me to adjust the bandsaw <laughs> to three degrees. <laughs> so we're going to cut this here, and basically we're bandsaw, bandsaw sculpting. Now look at the contour of the bowl of the seat. So it comes down here. This is the back of the seat. They call this the deck. This is the back of the seat, these lines here. We obviously don't want to start our cut back here. People make this mistake all the time. <laughs> you've got a funky look in the seat. And you can see where the, the bowl starts. So we want to mark this so that we start our cut here on that. Mm -hmm. And we'll have to, you know, use a grinder to sculpt this section out afterwards. Okay. But if you start the cut here, there's no recovery. Hmm. Is this helpful for people? I hope so. You think so? No one's yelled at me yet, so. No. All right. <laughs> Let's uh, adjust the band saw so that it's at three degrees. Line this guy up. I don't have um, I have this stuff collector and I use it for various machines. I have to figure out a really good way to put it on the hand saw. So we just make this Past it and get rid of any of the hysteresis in the gear system. The screw. This is an overly <laughs> critical lock the table. I always check it. Look at that. It's too small. Two points. Expect it. Yeah. Well, that's kind of interesting. My table it was looks like it's loosening. And you know, so yeah, I want to make sure it's locked for the room. This this saw when I bought it didn't have an auxiliary table. There's supposed to be another table here. Mm -hmm. Mark it once about two thousand bucks. For the table. <laughs> I, I can't bring myself <laughs> can't bring myself to purchase that. But so um, we're at three degrees. Can I double check this so we can look to see? That we're, you know, if you want to go on this side, can we do that? Okay. Go on this side, and the blade is, is pretty much parallel to the wood now. So we're, we're good. Key is don't go past that point, don't go to the back of the bowl. And then we're going to cut it.
<laughs> this is the next, next year's Kim <laughs> I, I also, um, if you have a band socket, I always recommend uh, that you use the brake, turn it off. I mean, if it's just sitting there, this this saw will run for about five minutes. Yeah, I bet. Uh, with nothing. Um, um, I don't mind. My disc sander, my 20 inch disc sander, will run for about a half an hour. After wow. I turn it off, <laughs> and uh, I don't mind that that's just kind of running. It's just the motor. It's just the fact that the the, the uh, blade is riding on the tire, yeah. and it's stressing the tire more. And if you ever had to change out a tire on a thirty-two inch bandsaw, it's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so I always I always try to stop that when I think I'm going to and, and the reason I cut that up is that I, as many woodworkers are, I hoard wood, and I don't want to have those pieces thinking that there's someday I could come up with something that filled up with your whole shop is filled up with wood. So let's get that piece. Number two. This is it. I think you kind of get the idea of what's going on here. But, um, once we have that number two, three, and four timbers sculpted, and this number five and number one, in order to get this contour, you could bandsaw it up if you were really talented with a bandsaw on, on edge. <laughs> uh, I don't, I, I use an angle grinder with a 50 grit sandpaper and sculpt it out when I'm sculpting the whole thing. So once we get this, this joinery in place, um, we would, I would glue this up. I prefer pipe clamps. Um, and I do um, a pipe clamp here on the bottom, here on the top, here on the top, here on the bottom, and then I use an F style clamp on the back. And the reason with me is uh, pipe clamps, I think, add an element of stretch. You can really crank them in. Yeah. <laughs> I've used, uh, you know, box and wrenches to really crank them down. But you want to be careful about this. If you stress this too much, you get a crack right here or right here. Mm. So I use an F-style clamp just to snug this up so that I get <clears throat> should go back a perm. When you're making these angle cuts, these three degree angle cuts, I use a table saw. Now um, there are folks out in the world that, that use a, a jointer and put their fence at three degrees. And joint it, and the way, and, and that's certainly the way to do that. Um, and I've done that before. I've had more success with my table saw than I have with my jointer. And although this is a newer jointer to me, I haven't tried it with that. And I have a 16 inch crescent jointer as well. And um, for some reason, the crescent joiner, the, the fence doesn't hold three degrees all that much. So I was, I was struggling with getting uh, three degrees throughout the whole thing here. And then that means that the joint's not tight. You know, this, this joint here is not tight. So if you were gonna use a jointer and you're confident that your joiner fence and your table is gonna maintain three degrees, now I just mark this. And then, put it up against the fence, joint it, and keep on going until 
I have no marks on here to follow on that. And that's pretty standard for working picture. Procedure. All right, let's talk a little bit about um, these joints here, a little more about them. So we cut the, the dados for the seat first, and then we match the legs to the thickness of this tenon once we slot it with a half inch slotting bag. Um, and we'll get to that in a second. But, so we have to cut this dado first and um, make our measurement back to front. I think it's 18 inches. Uh, the templates, if you want them, like, we'll have that on there. And then I measure you know, one and three quarters of an inch up. I actually do it by this. I mark it. I scribe it with a knife. I tend to use um, uh, single beveled knives, or you know, some of the old timers use double beveled knives. I use a single beveled knife, and I always have the bevel on the waist side. Pretty common. Um, so I cut this dado on my Hammond slider. Ready to move? Sure. I'm going to move right fast. So. <laughs> there we go. So I'll measure this a quarter of an inch. I think it's a quarter of an inch cut. I get a test block. I test it, and it's a quarter of an inch. And then if um, let's try this this angle here. So imagine that this round over, this slot here is, is not there, but I cut that data. I cut this side on my knife wall. I stop the blade, I did not mark it. I know this is perfectly square for the blade, and I cut it. And then I plow out the waste in, be in, be in between here. I'll come back, uh, put this in the vise, hit it with a chisel or a, um, uh, hand router plane to the right depth and, and clean it up so this is nice and smooth. This I know is good. The back side is a little more challenging. So um, there's two tools that you have to have in order to make this chair. One is you have to have a table saw that can cut three inches. And the other is you need a band saw that can cut seven and a half inches. If you don't have that, then you're going to struggle. Um, so let's talk how we cut this three inch cut. My uh, assembly table, slash upbeat table, is not on rollers. It's on, I'm kind of fortunate these, these cores are nice oak cores, gymnasium <laughs> kind of mm. cores. And, uh, I just have some uh, some of this gray carpet on the bottom of the legs. And I get my, we're going to come right there. Oh, okay. <laughs> I need my fence. This is, this is a, a, that's an interesting dilemma if you ever have old machinery. This spot is an upside down T slot, but it's also very thin. Um, so to find a fence, I mean, I, uh, a miter uh, for that is, is quite challenging. And if you go to the manufacturer's website, they went out of business in 1960. This is Oliver. They went out of business somewhere around 1960. And there's a fellow that, um, has been kind of keeping the records and, uh, and he sells parts, used parts, and he manufactured some parts and everything. Wow, this is expensive. <laughs> more, than, more than I paid for the whole saw. So, so um, if, you're, if, you, if you find a, a good Oliver 88 table saw for sale on Craigslist and it doesn't have all the parts, <laughs> uh, do some more research because. Um, make friends with the machinist. Yeah. Make friends with the machinist. <laughs> And you can see this one's been printed. This thing was um, was uh, used in a plexiglass 
thing because when I bought it, I think I, I think I did. I paid like maybe eight hundred bucks for it, and um, I think it's uh, five horsepower. It can take an eighteen-inch blade. I don't put the eighteen-inch blade on. I use the smaller blade because the windage is just incredibly scary. You know, and these saws are known to be extremely dusty, and it is. Dust flies all over the place, even with the dust collection. And there's so many gaps. In it. So what I do is I have a uh, fence. And the only reason I'm going to do this is because I want to share with you an opportunity to do some really good accurate work with that double gauge. The digital gauge. Um, and, and this might help with any other work that you're doing. I don't know. Maybe, maybe folks already know what I'm doing. This is, this is how I do it. So um, on this saw, this, this table slides. Need some more clamps. Right back. So I'm going to clamp this uh, fence. And before I got into this, I mean, I just put it in like a, I don't know, you run out of power? I don't know. About three or four months ago, I bought this, this digital gauge. So I'm, I'm zeroed there, and I want to make sure my blade. Off of the, the actual tip of the blade is. You can see that, but you get the idea that I'm supposed to be ninety on this side. This is the rolling side, so uh, I'm, I'm not confident that this is going to be perfectly square throughout the whole cut. So what I do is I take my lead piece, or my seat piece that needs to be cut. That my own. <laughs> yeah. This is where you need something to be cut three inches. So you have to imagine that that, that slot, this curved slot is not there. And I clamp this. So that the curve is going to cut just on the inside. I've marked this out. This is so this is two and a half inches here, three inches up there. So I scribe that with my knife and my that. I tend to use a knife when I can. Um, just to prevent the tear out like that. So anyways, I, I bring this up, I clamp it. And I clamp it. And so I've got my got this zero. If this is 90 degrees, take a scale, metal scale. I put that on there, and I go like this, and I make sure that it's at 90 degrees. Nice. I'll, I'll make magic. <laughs> I mean, isn't that kind of neat that you, cool. you could do this with all these stuff? But the kicker here is, is that you need three inches to be able to cut up. That's the tough one. I um, struggled. I, this, this particular base, the saw base, wouldn't fit through one of the doors on the second floor. 
Okay. So we had to crane it into the window. And I didn't even know if it was going to fit through the window. And I was researching how many saws can actually. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a direct drive saw. I prefer direct drive tools. The only, the only tool that I have is not direct drive. I think is that way over there. It's, belt, it's, it's got a belt on it. I think that's it. Oh, no, I'm sorry. My, my radio drill as well. I'm not a big fan of belts because they're, they're thorough. But in any event, you know how to, how to cut that. And then the next cut is far easier. There are two, two and a quarter inches. So you can imagine and visualize the fact that we just cut this here and we cut this dado. But these uh, uh, round over slotted grooves have not been cut. Those are cut on the router table. So, um, white design, uh, great, great company that makes uh, rubber bits, makes a matching set of round over and sliding bit. And we'll go over to the router to do that, but you can you can see how this is that this cuts that by following the bearing, cuts that slot, turn it over, cuts the slot. This would be done on a router table with a no fence and a starting pin. When you're doing uh, this, and, and you have to be conscious of it if you're doing an up cut or a down cut. It's very difficult to avoid doing a, um, you know, an uh, upward cut. What I do, so, um, uh, imagine that um, the router table is here. When I, and I'm on a starter pin, I usually start it right here. I bring this in so that it's gonna be just shy of this shoulder right here and I have to do an up cut to that but it's a very small up cut <laughs> following that and then then I do the, the downward cut and uh, flip this over and it's just the opposite following that. these these are much simpler and when when you're doing this cut so this would be like this don't on, on this you don't want to run out on the corners but on this one, if you run out and you go over this and it, it rounds off this, don't worry about it because this back side of the leg and this side side of the, of the uh, leg is um, proud, so it's going to be cut off anyways. But on this one, you have to worry about it. Okay, so that's yeah. um, <clears throat> that's pretty much the seat prior to the final sculpting. Let's move on to the legs. Um, <laughs> Still got power? Oh yeah. Still got internet? Yep. Looks like it. Is this is this good or am I boring everybody? I don't know. I don't see anybody asleep, so It's always good to um, mark your parts um, all over the place on what you're going to do. If you notice, um, I have uh, on the, the saddle our legs. Different people use different conventions for naming their parts. And, um, some people use it when you're facing the seat, which side is left and right, and when you're sitting in the seat, which side is right and left. I use the sitting side. So this would be, you know, if you're sitting in the chair, the arms here, this would be the right-hand side, left-hand side. Believe me, I've got a lot of uh, right legs and no left legs that are spares. It will never be used you know, for not keeping track of this. And it gets even worse when you're making six of them at a time. You know. Woodworking is easy compared to organizational skills when it gets to six pieces <laughs> at the same time. So, um, so here is our left side. It's the inside. 
and you can see that I'm really squeezing this piece of wood with it. Yeah. 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 That's, that's you know, I'm, I'm trying to you know use a piece of wood. To... Grain orientation is important on chair legs. You know, we want the grains to be going grain up and down. We don't want it to be going at an angle. We don't want to chip out the bottom of it. Same, same thing with the with the back leg. And, and getting back to the seat, I spend a fair amount of time trying to choose which boards would um, complement each other when they get sculpted. But when it comes down to it, you know, you're cutting down a, a half of an inch. You really don't know what's underneath <laughs> there and how it's going to how it's going to uh, turn turn out. So. Mm. Um, but even I've seen videos of Sam Malik doing the same thing. You know, he's spending time flopping boards around, ask his wife, you know, what, what does this look like? You know, how does this look like? In reality, when, when you're cutting down on from here, it's almost an inch. You know, it's a half an inch here. Um, uh, I would go more for uh, color coordination versus grain coordination. Like if you can, although I, I still do like this this year grain. You know, this is the bowl. It's kind of like the, the cheeks of the, the bowl. <laughs> I try to do stuff, or this is the where the pommel is going to come up. So is good. is the rest of the seat just the angle grinder? Pretty much yeah. at this point. Um, um, like I said, if you're really good with a bandsaw, and you think you can cut on this line and this line. On the edge, <laughs> give it a go. I haven't been successful with that. Yeah. So um, I I use an angle grinder. I tried everything, cuts all bits. I, mm -hmm. And I find uh, actually make sure I'm telling the right thing here. I have a, a festool grinder, dust was you know it's supposed to collect all the dust. I hook it up to my dust collector, and um, or it's uh, 50 grid, I'm, I'm seeing the official grid. That's it. But I've got, I've got other things. I've got, you know, I've got the um, Lancelot, you know, I've tried that. <laughs> uh, I've tried cut saw, I've tried all that stuff, and, and I'm okay with this. You know. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so we glued this up, we, we cut these uh, slots. And now we um, measured this tenon, I would call out of the bridle joint, to match the mortise for this. And then we have to round this over. Now, that round over bit, that slotting bit that we have here, is um, a match set with the round over bit, which I have in my, my router table. And um, that, we use the fence. So we set the fence up such that um, we get this round over here. And what I do is I just plow it in like this, turn it over to the other, the other side. Um, and I try, I, I do test pieces, and I try to get this so that it's fine. You can feel right here, you feel an edge. I want you to feel that edge. You know, oh, yeah. There's a little bit of an edge there. Um, that's going to be carved out anyways later on. But um, you want to get that as close as possible for the, this is the left. For the tightest possible joint here. And um, if for some reason that um, you're not getting a good I know that's better. But if you're not getting a good seat right here, this is kind of one of the loose tricks too. And everybody's taking credit for this as well. I'm gonna be really gentle putting these in yeah. and out. And you do it a lot of times, so I'm like really good at that. Um, this is sort of secret with um Sandpaper on it, and you you roll it over to take that edge off. But you don't want to do just one side. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. want to, that's why you got the block. You want to do both sides at the same time. 
so that the top and the bottom and if you're not getting a tight joint there that's one method that you can do um, the other is is that you might not have cut this deep enough that's a hard recovery after you know after you've rounded it over that's a hard recovery so the way to test that before you round it over is just to make sure that it will fit in there Thoughts behind that? Yep. yep. Front legs. We've got, um, so you have to imagine that, that this piece right here is like this piece, and it hasn't, so we, we put the dados in, and we talked about how to make a dado all the way around without having too much of a shoulder here, right? By, the blade's running, you rub it up against the previous dado cut, you hear it, you get familiar with the saw, the sound, and then you cut it. You can feel there's a small lip there, but yeah, that's that's it, that's okay, but you don't want something much bigger than that. Feel that piece of wood, that's um, Jatoba. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, I think I uh, somebody ever commissions you to make a chair out of Jatoba? <laughs> Decline. I've, I've made a, a few and mm. You have to buy all the tools, you know, sharp, sharpen your saw blades, hands off blades, and all. Jatoba is a tough set to work with. <laughs> it's a fourth of iron. Yeah. So, um, it's kind of like teeth, I guess. So, um, imagine this piece of wood. It's a front leg. Um, we've got this um, rounded over on the insides to fit the seat joint. But we don't have turned in. I throw this in the lathe, and you don't have to, but I like to because when this transition from the top of the front leg to the seat, if you look here, it's more than as round as possible or, or close. And I don't know about anybody else, but I can't sculpt. Make a file <laughs> round perfectly. So I throw this in the lathe and I turn that down to one and a quarter inches to make it close to round that I use them as the template when I do the arms. All in that logic? Yeah. yeah. And so now let's go to the bandsaw and cut that out. Once we've once we've got the top rounded, oh I should send we want to drill a hole. And there's, there's two thoughts or two conventions and um, the people that use either convention don't agree with each other you know so um, on how to drill a hole on a piece of square, square, square stock like this in a lathe let's go over the lathe yeah, yeah, I think it's like 8.30. Oh, man. I, <laughs> it's, I know it's past my bedtime. <laughs> so uh, let me see if I can. So um, half inch, half inch dowel goes from the uh, front leg into the seat. I'm going to start talking faster and going quicker. So there's, there's some people that live by this convention that the drill should be spinning and the work should be still. So you would put your drill in the headstock and the drill would be spinning and right. you advance the wood by holding it, by holding it and putting in the drill. Um, and I tried both ways, and quite frankly, I don't like either way, but <laughs> you gotta choose one. Um, or you can have the drill be stationary and the piece is, is rotating. Now a square piece rotating to me is a little more dangerous than a, a drill bit rotating. You know, because this thing, yeah. I mean, if you get your hand stuck in there, you notice I, I have an injury. Mm -hmm. um, that's a lathe injury from trying to figure out how to use a skew chisel. Ooh. Yes, skew <laughs> chisels are dangerous. It wasn't bad, but. So my, my preference, and a lot of people don't like this, is to put the drill in the rotating part, the head, uh, the headstock, 
and pu you know, push the piece of wood while I'm holding it into the drill bit. Um, like I said, a lot of people don't like that. You're gonna choose, but there's another way to do this and, then, and that is, is actually drill the hole before you turn this and use your, um, this, this isn't a, um, a spinning um, center. Uh, it's a dead, dead center. I have to get my light centers over there. But if you had a light center to put it in that half inch hole that you just drilled and, and, um, and then turn this after the fact. So let me show you. I, I, and I do this occasionally. I don't know why. I do things differently. If you haven't seen this before, This dowel, I think it's called dowel. Oh yeah. So if this was if this was um, still square, square one. <laughs> Ryan said he was going to get home before nine o'clock. I don't <laughs> think so. I drive real fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, you know, we would find center, take our dowel whip, um, put it on here. What I actually do is I take my drill bit. Before it's even in my, my and I use the, uh, like a, uh, the key of in. You know, put it, I find center first, I lock this, pull this out, and then put the drill bit in my, um, oh, right. Because your drill, your drill will um, impact the location of that. I want to show you something about this. This is a, I took a chair making class with Peter Gilbert in February to make um, Windsor chairs out of green wood and it's a phenomenal class. I would highly recommend it. If you get an opportunity to do that in New Hampshire, um, he, he actually has uh, instruction on how to make chairs out of green wood. A regular you know, metal like drill bit into a brad point drill bit. Because um, it's hard to find a brad point that's uh, you know one and a half inches. <laughs> <laughs> so he he actually has an instruction on how to make them. Brad point. But one of the things that I like about him is he's always pushing the limits on how to do things better. And if if he saw this, he'd probably be upset that I. But I'm giving him credit. I'll for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, watch your drill bit. You put your put your drill bit in here. And is that point going or is it wobbling all over? If it's wobbling all over, just rotate this just a hair. Give it another test. In other words, you want that to be straight. The other thing is, is that you want the drill to be going at full speed. You don't want to be on your piece and then start. That's a rip out opportunity. You want to be off it, go up it, and then plunge in. So what I do, we center this, we lock that in, start the drill bit, and then plow through. And what we do after that is we would put this in the lathe on a live center, and then we would turn this round so that we have a reference like this. We would end up with this. We have a reference with the sculpt to when we put the, the um, arm on. Okay. Yep. Following up. Yeah. All right. Let's bandsaw this guy out. Or I, I guess you guys don't need to see me. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's come on. Someone's half the center of this thing. Oh, here's an important thing. This is, this can get you in trouble with you. If you buy plans, and there are plenty of people that have plans for these chairs. If you buy plans, I think um, the Wood Whisperer sells plans for this chair. Um, the Canadian Woodworks guy sells plans for this. Charles Brock sends plans yeah. for this. I mean, there's, you, you can get plans. 
A lot of times what they don't tell you, there's a little tricks in the trade, <laughs> that things that can get you in trouble. And one of the big things that can get you in trouble, I have a, I have a, a white bullet here. I can cut if you want to talk about chairs forever, but um, is it really eight thirty? Oh, it's not so far. Concerned about it? Yeah. No. So, um, our template. Let's imagine that um, we have a piece of wood. Well, let's go like this. We have a piece of what is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven inch. It's probably the convention. It's a piece of wood like this. And we're going to make a back leg out of it. We're confident with the grain and everything. And if you notice, we can make one and two. What I prefer to do is I prefer to put this seat joint right up against the jointed surface of my stock. Okay. okay. And like I said earlier, it's, it's best to have eight quarter stock. If you have um, one and seven eighths is okay. When you start getting below that, you, you know, you're kind of compromising the structural integrity of the ship. So I can actually get two pieces out of this, right? So I can get another one right here. And normally the grain is complementing and they kind of look like each other as, as well. Mm -hmm. It's the same color. Blah, blah, blah. But the point I want to make is that to make this joint, this dado right here, you can imagine putting this on your table saw and trying to balance it on from here to here. Right. You know? Or you have to cut this dado as well. And if you do it on the table saw on a sled, you only got this surface to reference against the fence of your sled. So the way to get around that. This is what I do. So this is this is our um, our arm joint. And this is our seat joint. So this, let's say this is our, um, it's not really, let's be, this must come down a little bit more. So what, and this is our jointed surface when we cut our stock. I bandsaw this out and I just avoid, uh, I, I try to cut the center of the line when I bandsaw and then from here I want to go like this. So now I've got a, a good reference surface in order to cut this dado in here on both the, on when it's on its side and when it's up, up um, and then um, this one, um, if I do this, normally I don't get enough, you know, a size of piece or a piece of wood that's so big that I can get two loads out of it. But if I did, what I would do is um, after I bandsaw this out, I joint, I rejoint that surface, right. and then put my template down with it. But I want this surface, this surface here, to be square uh, on edge. This this surface is interesting. I bandsaw that. This is this is a good point to have. I go over to my disc, disc sander <laughs> and I kiss it. So you can see that one's bandsawed. Yeah. But I would kiss it with that, and then I would take my other leg, match it up to that, and put them together. Oh, kiss yeah. them both so that this angle. In relationship to this is equal on both legs. In other words, you don't want one arm going like that, mm. you know, up like that, and then pull oh, yeah, the right. yeah. <laughs> So that's how you do both. Now, um, 
these links also have this is a, this is just the MSAL work. Um, here. Let me look at that. Outside right. If I put that on the chair that we have, that's outside left. <laughs> you, you see why it's a spear? Yeah. It's just hanging around here. And, but um, also, um, I'm going to have to cut. We take our template, we mark it, and then we cut the inside. Like these in Dogo, but um, yeah. yeah. So you get the idea. We cut that, the template move, come back here. Okay. Um, we band, I band, what I typically do is I'll band saw that out halfway down the line, and then I go to my um, spindle sander and I take it down so that I can just barely see the line. I, a lot of people, what they will do is they will um, make a solid template and they'll do it on a router table with a, uh, like a template cutting bit. And I have those, like I said, I don't want routers and spindles, so <laughs> I'll, I'll sand it. I get my dust collector for the sander. It's just my, my preference, but it certainly can be done uh, on, on, with a router bit, a templating router bit. And they make them one side makes them their they make a small they make a small cut and then climb up the cut by using the bearing on the previous cut and all that stuff. All right. On to the arms, I think. Everybody still awake? I think so. Everybody <laughs> still there? No, some people. <laughs> some of you fall asleep. <laughs> on the bed. Hey, it's past my <laughs> so this goes assemble the seat, put the legs on, and try to quickly go through the arm process in the um, backwards. So and I apologize if I'm too slow of teaching this, but it actually takes me uh, to make one chair. Oh, Ryan, I spent three days sanding one chair. When it's all, when it's all been sculpted, I take three days to sand it. And then uh, I finish it. I do three coats of finish. I used to try to make my own, like move, knock on uh, finish, you know, linseed oil and shellac. And, and <laughs> I got, I had bees at my house and using bees wax and, and water locks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I do three coats of water locks. My first coat I consider the soap coat. 24 hours later, it's hardened. I do this, the finish coat is the second coat. And the third coat is the insurance coat. <laughs> and then, uh, because you never know if you hit everything with the second coat. And the second coat is probably fine if you can hit everything, but you just never know. If you can. It's so glossy that you can't tell. I, I sand to 400 to 600 grit. I use, um, is it Abernet? You know, the mesh, the mesh type sandpaper for the finer grits. And uh, then I, I follow it up with, um, I used to use just butcher's wax, but I met a guy at the, at the uh, Providence, Rhode Island uh, furniture show. He was across my booth. Uh, and he, he makes um, chairs that have like rolling seats, you know, fabric rolling seats. Yeah. And he's from Maine. Can't remember the guy's name, but and then even I asked him what he used, and he uses this Liberon um, paste wax in mm -hmm. New Hampshire. Yeah. So that's what I use now, and I wax it all up. Um, and I put the wax on with uh, uh, Scotch Brite, the green type Scotch Brite, in case that um, I don't have a dust free atmosphere um, to do finishing. So if I'm finishing, um, I use Scotch Brite because it will take any of the imperfections, you know, the dust collected on the water logs as it as it cured. So that's the finishing process. But so um, we have the seat done. 
Um, we need to do a little bit of band. So I'd say it's all glued up and everything. We have to do a little band sign. We cut off this um, thigh relief section here. The thigh relief section here. There's a contour that goes here because the, the backs of the leg doesn't, the back leg is, uh, only sits for this distance as much as proud. So we need to cut some bands on that. And there's templates for that. The buy templates so you can get that. Let's put some templates. Like I said, I prefer um, uh, pipe clamps, but just for this, I'm going to use a headstone clamp. So we can get this assembled very quickly. As, as I mentioned before, when you're clamping, be very conscious of this piece right here. If, um, if your joint is not good, it's not tight, those two, three degree bevels that complement each other. If they're not good for you, horses, you get a cut right down in here. No recovery from that. <laughs> so, um, oh, that's first. Right. If um, for any reason, uh, any of your members are out and about in Western Massachusetts, up here in the Shelburne Falls. You want to stop by? Um, give me a holler, make sure I'm here, and come by for a visit. As always, um, glue ups can be uh, stressful. So I have uh, my sort of glue up safety line. Um, so I put a line across here that I, I know that I've got the right goods in the right spot, not upside down or, or anything like that. You know? um, Have an audience. Yep. Hang in there. Hang in there. Have all these smokers. And, and the rest of us should go pretty, pretty quickly. Oh. I have a few opportunity to look in the candy box and all the tools <laughs> 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 I'm a collector mm -hmm. and, and still collecting. Um, my, my two sons are woodworkers. Um, one of my sons is, uh, and he was no longer, but he was a tennessee with a, a German and a pipe organ maker. Wow. And this uh, is a Czechoslovakian cabinet maker who had one client for 20 years. Wow. <laughs> and the client was a, um, an architect in Manhattan, so you know, they, oh, okay. they ended up being going to different places, but, but uh, in any event. So um, we have almost every reuse of tool that's been made. <laughs> <laughs> I went to uh, one of their lobster fests one year, a couple years back, and I had ordered their, um, is it Preston's book shape? Their little glass book shape? Man, you no, know, I ordered like six months earlier before the show. I, I went to the show and I walked into the into the showroom and said, Hey, is there any chance I could check on an order that I made months back? I said, What's your name? This is Pat Mayer. Hey Pat, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, I'm spending too much money here. <laughs> Now, 
can't do this because we wouldn't want to, we wouldn't want to um, do the joinery for the iron unless the legs were glued and in place, finalized. Otherwise, there's an opportunity for them to go off. Um, one of the things we should share with you is, um, so we glue up the front legs, we glue up the back legs, and um, and what, what I do, I was getting ahead of myself with the hand, no time to speak things up. But, so um, we've got to put a, a screw in there. I'll get a scale line mark from corner to corner, find out where the center is, and then I uh, drill a hole right there. And that drill is a special drill. And so it's a it's a taper drill. And you can buy these uh, most of it like woodworking uh, tools for woodworkers. Is that somewhere? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Tools for working wood. Yeah. Tools for working wood. Um, the place in Atlanta. Highland. Highland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know Nielsen. I know where they are. So. Um, <laughs> So you can see it. Can you see that point right there? Yeah, I think so. So we 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 mark a, a center mark here, and I'm going to drill in there with this tapered drill. Uh, you can buy this at, at like any woodworking store, and I plow it down to that point right there. Uh, so there's a mark on it. You see that? I plow in that depth. Now. If you were to look at some of Malou's chairs, he would actually have two two screws, one here and one down here. If you opt to do that, you want to make sure that this top one is uh, shorter than the lower one okay. because the seat is contoured and you're, right. up, you're, you're <laughs> able to blow out of the, you know, the sculpted part of the seat. I just do one. My thinking on the screws is that they are only there to facilitate sculpting. Now, when the sculpting comes in, you're taking this uh, on and off, on and off, on and off, many times. Um, same with the back. And the, as you know, when you put a wood screw in wood, pull it out, put it back in 30 times or so, that, that screw is yeah. basically <laughs> functionless and it's the glue that's holding the joint. So um, when I do glue up, I put the screw in, you know, drive it home the final time. It's all glued up. I also put a clamp on it and thinking that the screw might not drive the joint all the way home. The clamp will. <laughs> and occasionally what I'll do is I'll put a clamp under this. Well, I'll start out with a glue up and this is what makes the glue up kind of complex. And I'm not going to understand glue up so going bad. I've got two chairs over there with bad glue up. <laughs> So um, when I glue it up, I glue it up. First of all, I'll make sure the joint is able to get tight. And if it is, I'll glue and screw. And I put the first clamp, kind of hear that going in, the first clamp right on the hole for the screw. And then I put a clamp down here, down here, and up here, and up here. So, and then I take off the middle clamp. <laughs> and then I, 24 hours later, I come back and I do the same thing with the back. The back, I do two screws, um, but if the screws are not up and down, they're horizontal, one, two, you know, I guess in some sort of equal to the other side. Do you glue up the seat and the I glue up the seat first, the seat first, the seat first 24 hours later. Actually, what I do is I glue up the seat and then I'll rough sculpt the seat. Hmm. Um, yeah, easier uh, to sculpt. Yeah, yeah with the legs, <laughs> you know, I've got it on this level versus this level. And if you notice around that shop, I've got these kind of like, a, I don't even know what I call them, pedestal or something, yeah. that, that um, I can change the elevation for sculpting purposes. Hmm. This, this leg, the bottom leg will get sculpted. We, we, we can talk about that a little bit later. But then the front leg will get sculpted um, and the headrest will get sculpted before assembly. 
as well as the CPU. Um, but the bottom line is, is that three days of sanding is going to finalize it. <laughs> okay, so we've got this, you can imagine this is all glued, screwed, and, and actually pegged. You can see, now you can kind of see more of the pegs. <laughs> Two and a half. If I I made four chairs in three weeks, four chairs together in a, a set for a client in um, three weeks, that was a challenge. My dad was pushing, and that's I'm a retired guy. I don't work any more than eight hours a day. <laughs> I, don't want, I try not to work on Saturdays and Sundays. So, um, so once we have this hole in, and this is glued, and it, it's been uh, uh, you know, the glue, I, I just about everything, I want 24 hours to glue. I don't like to push it. I don't want to, I don't want to put this much work into it and have it fail because the right. glue is not dry. You know? yeah. So I, I'm patient and wait. What I do is, um, so we've got some holes here with screws in them. And um, if you haven't seen these before, they're Veri Veritas, Veritas. Um, uh, tenoners, they actually make them for, you know, making yeah. a tenon on the end of a, a, a spindle or something. Um, I use these to make my uh, pegs. So this is, um, I used to use ebony, and now um, uh, ebony, I'm having a hard time finding ebony, but also when I was started having a hard time finding ebony, um, my wood supplier turned me on to Cadillacs, Cadillacs. Huh. They call it Mexican uh, ebony. Hmm. <laughs> it sounds cheap, doesn't it? <laughs> but actually, it's it's more forgiving than ebony. Ebony, uh, if you get true ebony, uh, there's always a chance it's going to splinter. I mean, it's mm -hmm. really hard stuff. Yeah. And this stuff is more workable, and it, it it does. It looks when you're looking at the end grain, it looks like ebony. So I've been yeah. using this for the last year or so, and I kind of like it, but. Actually, I'm having a hard time finding it now. <laughs> so, so what I do is I put this in the vise. Put this, put, yeah. this in, yeah. put this in the vise, and I take my uh, half-inch tenoner, and this is half-inch stock. I ripped, I bought a chunk of it, and I ripped it out a half-inch, and I um, start it with a half-inch tenoner, and then I go to my three-eighths tenoner. And then finalize it. If you try to go with a three eighths, you're going to work a lot to get down to the right size. And if for some reason either one of these won't let you get down to the diameter that you need, I think it's seven sixteenths is what this thing is, just just shy of a half inch. Um, uh, what you can do is. Uh, Because usually, if you're if you're if you're trying to get down to a certain depth, what I do is I turn this half inch one down until the stock is just flush with with this that surface right there. And I do this. I hold this in the vise, but here we can do this. And if you can't get that down to that surface, then what you can do, what's holding you up, are the edges. So you can file this edge down on that with a rasp. I highly recommend these uh, Ario rasps if you're not familiar with them, hand stitch wraps. They have a, a bunch of them, they're great. And then and then go with your three eighths and get it down to final dimension. Test it out, put it in your hole, make sure it doesn't bottom out on mm. the screw head. And what I do is I've got a, a special hammer. It's like the only thing I use this hammer for is the Japanese hammer. So we can buy this, uh, this um, either ebony or Cadillacs. It's got this kind of funky waxy stuff all over it. You can see the wax on there. Uh, so my hammer's got wax all over it. And what I do is I put it in, I glue it up. Put it in a hole and I tap it. And this hammer, I always use the same hammer because 
I know the sound of this hammer. Oh, I know when it's buried. <laughs> I know if it's hitting the screw head, or I know if it's properly seated. I can tell by the sound. Right. And then I leave that there for, this isn't a 24 hour glue. This is like a, you know, <laughs> yeah. an hour or something like that. Glue wise, probably important to say, I use type one glue for almost every joint, except on my rocking chairs, on the spindles, I use um, high glue to orientate the spindles when you're doing a glue up, it, it's hard. You get seven spindles and you're trying to get them all the same direction and height and everything with the headrest. And that's a really complex, it's, it's like a three person glue up. You know? <laughs> and and uh, I, I uh, use high glue because I can hit it with heat kind of afterwards and adjust it. And the other thing that I do, uh, the other glue that I use is system, I think it's system five, does that sound right? Two player epoxy that um, my rockers, when the, when the sled is going into the uh, into the bottom of the front and back legs, I use uh, epoxy, two, two part epoxy, system, system three. Other than that, I use type one three with the early things. I'm curious, I'm gonna have to hurry go on. But I wanted to share with you um, how to make a, how to make a ten link. You know, I've got the uh, the plug makers that you can put on the end of the drill and it's, you know, punch, punch and wood and everything. Typically, when you're doing that, you're going on flat grain, you know, versus this you want to be on the, you know, you want the grain going in the, in the plug direction. Yeah. Um, one of the challenges is um, uh, sanding this plug when you when you finally do the sculpting work and you put this in there. This is a much harder material than this, you know, you're, and, and I, I struggle with this all the time. Like how do you how do you compensate for that? Mm -hmm. You just got to be be mindful of that when you do that. Let's quickly talk about. I was hoping you have a solution for them. <laughs> no, I, I have, Peter Goldberg probably got a solution for that. You know, he's always looking at that stuff. Um, yeah. So um, Next, we would put the irons on, but what I want to do is quickly because it's it's much easier to do the uh, back. So you have to imagine that the irons are on. And don't fall apart on me. Normally, when I do this, it's all glued up. So that didn't sound good. So um, the the backrest I want to show you because it's pretty, pretty simple. I got a big piece of wood here for the backrest, and I would choose what looks really cool. You know, and I, I, I look for wood with character. I don't look for wood that, you know, looks like it should be in a, a multi-million dollar home dining room set, you know, <laughs> that they, they, they want it to look consistent all the way through, which is, which has its place and everything, but I look for stuff with character. So, and, and so you can imagine this back, back rest being, you know, I kind of do yeah. this, you know. So let's just say we pick the spot. Imagining that the arms are already on, so. <laughs> so more close here. And this is this is like the easiest part of this whole process. If if you did that three inch vertical cut on the seat, if it was truly square with the, this surface. Right. And this one is square, the V should be parallel. And that makes it easy. If they're not parallel, you got a challenge. <laughs> that. So, so that's one of, I think, the most ingenious things is that, uh, um, you know, on, on a rocking chair, they go out like this. But that surface and that surface where the headrest goes is parallel. If this joint is right, right. So, um, so you want to pay attention to that. That when you make that three-inch cut, that's kind of critical. I, I shouldn't say critical. It makes your life a lot easier. So um, it's fairly simple. In fact, I don't even have to uh, put on a line. If you grab this pencil. 
you know, there's been a lot of discussion on woodworking farms, how that these uh, chemical premises, a lot of people hate that. I'm a mechanical engineer. I took <laughs> mechanical engineering drawings classes five years ago. Um, pump forms, that's it. If you pump too many times, it's gonna break on you. If you drop this, pump a bunch of times, pull out that broken point <laughs> and start over again, you know, because it's, it's just gonna slide back up. So there's a way to use this pencil. And, um, I guess it's a two. Your members already know that. So what we would do is we would put this up here. We would make it this top surfaces. And if I was doing this by myself, I would find that. And then you just need to mark the inside of that. Mark the inside of that. And if that was our chosen point, this is how I do it. This is when furniture makers would say, never use this piece of equipment, this tool. I go over to my miter, my miter saw. <laughs> I, know, I know I've got a good blade. And what I do is I use, I use the laser to get close. I turn the laser off and then I adjust this so that the blade runs just on the outside of that line. I mean, I pay a lot of attention to making that cut and then I do the other side. And then I put it up in here and I find it on the other side. We wouldn't want to do that now because this isn't fixed and it's gonna, it could be out the next time we do it. But, um, it, but it's, it's, it's that simple. The surface needs to be good with no, um, no uh, snipe when you, when you prepare your stock. Yeah. And there is, there is a little bit of flexibility to yeah. pull this in if it's off a hair. Mm -hmm. If it's off by uh, more than a 64th of an inch, you might want to cut it in line with that. Yeah. You know? Is so that domino game? Is that the. No, no. Yeah. And, and that's, so that's a, uh, this is a long grain and end grain butt joint. Right. And three screws. Oh, okay. And, and so there's there's three screws in here, um, and it, uh, and in the um, uh, the same way, you know, they have no function other than taking them apart, putting it back together, scrapping them on. Uh, so let's um, quickly talk about the arms because there's this is a little more complex. So in um, somewhere. Yeah. I need a drink of water. I don't normally talk this much. Touched. Want some water? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, this this could easily be the most challenging part of this chair. So um. I've, chose, I've prepared and chosen my farm stock. This, um, this material is uh, not a quarter. It's just shy, I think. Uh, I do everything in um, uh, on thickness. I do everything with a micrometer. So let's, let's look at this. It is um, uh, one inch. 940, right? Yeah, 40. And so my other piece <laughs> is exactly the same. Now, I don't care if my backrest was 950. <laughs> right. And my seat <laughs> things are, you know, 995. Mm -hmm. I what I care about is that all of these are the same. Yeah. These two are the same. This just a lot. I don't mill up stock from start to finish and then say, okay, I'm gonna make a chair out of this stock. I know it up as I progress. And each piece, each top, each, you know, each side is, is the same. So, so we have this, we, we are very confident that this surface is square and it's all four square. I even hand plan all the machine marks out of this. I want this thing on both sides to be spot on. I take this, and now this stock is um, for, for an arm. Typically, typically we want at least 22 inches. 
and six and three quarter. And um, this piece is something like 25 inches. And I'd like to do, the minimum is 22 inches. And I like to do something greater than the minimum. In case my joint isn't working out, I've got another opportunity to make the joint. You following that? Yes. Oh. We've spent some time trying to figure out which is the best orientation on this. We take this, we've got our hole drilled in the leg. We need a clamp. Long clamp to put this, and we clamp. Now, this arm will be installed prior to the backrest. The backrest will be the last thing we put on, but we did that for just ease of demonstration. And I want to make sure that the bottom of this is centered on that circular part that I cut and the lathe. Now that, that's one of the reasons for turning on the lathe. You can imagine if that was square and say, oh, you know, I need to center that thing, you know, how am I going to do that? So we get that center. Look close to center. That's pretty good. Do you just eyeball yeah. it or mm -hmm. do you just eyeball uh, it? Well, I kind of use Yeah, there you go. You know, <laughs> I trust my fingers more than my uh, more than my eyes. Mm -hmm. My eyes can tend to deceive me. So um, I'm confident that there's no air gap in there. That it's flat. You know, this clamp is above that circular part of the leg, and and it's flat. And my arm is now going on the inside of the back leg. And what I do. As I come over and I thread a line, okay. um, and, and you, you can see that I, I, I in reality, if I was going to do this, I want I want just a minimal amount that I can on the back side, so. When I cut the back side, I got the minimal minimal amount of waste on this back side. So I come over and I, I got this angle here, and I'm going to describe that. And then I go over to my miter saw. And I cut. I cut to that angle. See that one right there? Anyways, we, we cut that angle. <laughs> so um, let's go ahead and do that. Only because I know I've got enough waste on this that I can <laughs> do more. And so this is this the miners, the miners saws are pretty bad. I don't cut even though. I know my blade's pretty good. Well, I turn my laser off. I don't trust my laser. But, you know, <laughs> I, I roll my blade down the line. I'm good on splitting the line, even though it's just a small pencil line. Boy, I hope I, I, hope I don't get this <laughs> <laughs> so now we're gonna we're gonna pick that up and hopefully that angle on the up and down. This is a little more complex than everything else we've done thus far. Uh -huh. 
they do take care of their pot and making sure that this one is spot on. Okay, so you bring your camera over on this slide and look at this, just this vertical part right here. So we're, we're flush on the front leg, we want flush. We're um, flush on the back joint, but if you look, because that's a compound angle, we've got a big gap on the inside. Oh yeah. So we have to, we have to compensate for that, right? So the way I do that is I have a small and cheap bevel gauge. I'm not a big fan of these, but they have the um, uh, when you yeah. want screws, because they sometimes, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't sit flat. You know, it's dragging on the wing nut. You think it's flat. Have you tried the Veritas ones? No. And I really did. I one in the woodpecker ones. But oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 The guy who uh, owns this complex is a multi-millionaire. You know, he's a machinist. He's a, he's a mechanical engineer as well. And, He's, um, but he's a he loves to do machine work and not woodwork. He loves wood, but if he can't work wood, he likes to work machines. And you know, I, I tried to turn him on the woodpecker stuff. <laughs> 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 so um, we, need, we need a scale. And um, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this from that angle. You might be looking that direction. This way, yeah. So what I do is I put the scale on this surface, or it doesn't have to be a scale. Any any straight straight edge, you know. I I've used everything in the world, but and and then I take this bevel gauge and I find out what that angle is in reference to this side. Okay, and let's just say that's it. So then I come back and I mark this with a pencil. And, and I, I, I've never seen anybody do it this way. I've seen anybody do it a bunch of different ways, but I've had good success with this. And I, like I said, I take pride in making this joint like this. So I, Mark that. You know what? I need to I need to back up because we skipped this step. Okay, so we cut this angle here, but if you look at this chair, <laughs> let's say this is the right slide. This piece of wood is not big enough to make that sweeping part. <laughs> So, uh, and I forgot that step, and I apologize for that. So, uh, once we make this, this angle cut, a vertical uh, angle out of the compound angle, we need to um, What we do is, you know, here's somewhere the template, you know, where it is right now. What we do is we will uh, we put a template on. The template starts here, and it's going to have a cut, a bandsaw cut. It looks something like that. Probably wouldn't be that long because this piece is longer, but it would come out like this. So we would bandsaw that out. We would take that piece, knowing that this is a good flat 
no machine surfaces, no snipe. Same thing on this, we take that piece flip over here. I marked like this so that I have it lined back up and that's how we get the sleeve. Okay. We don't want it, and, and when we glue that up, I use every small clamp that I have, there's like 15 <laughs> clamps in order to clamp that up. I do one per night, you know, I do it at, mm. at the end of the day. <laughs> next morning I break it off, do the next one for another day. And um, when we do that, we take this piece off and we glue it onto this piece. The part that sits on the body on our uh, front leg has got to be flat. You know, if there's, if you didn't glue these up and they were offset a little bit, you got a problem. Right? You know, so you want to make sure that they're flat. So when I do the glue up, the first thing I do is I take this, I put it, you know, all the glue on, I put it on this side. I glue both pieces. So as always, always, I always do glue on both sides. I never glue one piece and hope that it's gonna right. carry the other. <laughs> um, and and uh, Hoadley, I don't know if you've seen his book, but he's he has a good discussion about that guy coming in now. So, anyways, um, what I do is I put a clamp on the horizontal like this way and this way until all my other clamps are seated, and then I pull those off. And make sure mm -hmm. that I'm still flush. Um, as you know, when you put two surfaces together, really they kind of slide all over the place and everything. So that's all. That's what I do to make sure that. So we we need to do that and make sure that that, that bottom side is flush. If it's off a little bit, and or let's say you know you've got a, a glue line down here, and you you've taken your chisel after the glue's dried and you removed all the glue, and and there's um, you know just you're not confident. It's a challenge, but you can do it. You can hand plane it. You know, make mm. sure it is. Um, you, you don't want to do a lot of that because you've already established that angle right there. Right. You know. So now you're now you're playing with that angle. And yeah. not doing that. <laughs> so once that's glued up and you have that sweeping motion, then you go through that same process that we did to get this other angle here. This is the angle we did with the other angle. And we're referencing this, I transferred it over to, over to <laughs> I transferred it over to um, to the top of this piece. And this this is this is the advantage of having a machine right here. So let's take a look. <laughs> So um, I'm in order to get that second angle on the compound angle, what I do is I go to my for some reason it's in the opposite direction. Um, I go to this and I adjust the first compound angle. I don't I, I don't even use measurement tools, you know, I prefer <laughs> not to do yeah, that. Yeah. You know, put a better gauge in. So I want it's not all that great here, but I want the table with the disc sander um, to be that first of the two of the compound angle. And once I'm confident that I'm there, I lock this up, turn my sander on, and I just push it in until I meet the line. So I'm I'm really doing pattern maker's work rather than joinery type work, you know. Yeah. And it's for me, it's always been spot on. Hmm. Once we have that, and we're confident that the joints are going to fit, and we have to use our imagination. But let's say the back and the front joints are going to fit. Nice and tight, and, and I can play around with it a little bit. You know, I don't play, knock it down, and, and I'm confident, and I go back there, you know, kiss it a little bit again with the other. Once I'm confident that that's there, and I'm centered here, I take a pencil, I mark this all the way around. And I use a mechanical pencil for this. I want the line to be as small as possible. All the way around. So you now you have to imagine that this thing is sweeping out like this. Now, this joint is good 
this force here, I'm centered, I pull this off, and this is, this is something I, I have to see everybody else who is needed. So I've got a somewhat of a circle marked where my leg is going to need it. And so what I'll do, I'll take um, any water. Yeah, for any water. Uh, take a, and you, you know, I didn't mark it all the way around, but it's pretty cold. And I, when I turned, when I turned this on the lathe, I marked the the diameter uh, of the okay. on the piece of stock. Right. You follow me? And so now I take that same thing, that same drafting template, and what I do is, and it doesn't really matter the orientation or anything, I just mark the quadrants. One, two, three, four. I think I moved it a little bit, but so now I have four quadrants. I come back with the scale. You see what I'm doing here? Yeah. I'm finding the center of that. Hit it with a, um, you know, an, an awl. I take it with my drill press. I drill in half inch hole right in the center there. Uh, one and a quarter inches. It's one and a quarter inches deep here. So I have a dowel that I need to put in there. And that dowel is going to be, you know, just shy of two and a half inches. I use um, doll work, doll pieces. I use dolls. <laughs> I used to make them. Mm. And I was, was going to say, you had to make making dolls. I <laughs> bought like a whole bunch of these things. And then so I. But the thing that I also do is I do them. I'm not confident in going deep So just to ensure that they're the right size, I drive them. So you can see that it's not even fitting. I went through there a couple times. I, but when I do it the second time or third time, I probably rotate it to make sure that I'm not straight. There's a, this is a challenge, you know, if you're going like this, I mean, we're exaggerating, yeah. you know, you're going to have a wacky doll. So, mm -hmm. you know, you got to, there's some, it takes some talent to hit it properly with a hammer. Yeah. The, the deal that I found was uh, my hammer's got to go in this direction, not, not like the conventional driving a nail. Mm -hmm. You know, I strike it like this. So once it goes through that, um, then I uh, have this, and I don't know who, who I got this from, but um, it flutes it. So it flutes the dowel. Hmm. It actually puts a point on the dowel. You can use, you know, it's a pencil sharpener type thing. And then you drive it through uh, making flutes. And I only do one time with the flutes. You don't want to, you know, you want too many flutes. Or... And the reason for that is really important. You don't want to do this. You don't want to do this with a straight dowel. If you put a dowel in, you come to assembly time, and you knock that in. You get a hydraulic lock, mm. you snap this leg, boom. Ooh, yeah. You know, you've got two weeks worth of work into this chair and all of a sudden, <laughs> boom, you, know, you lost the leg. 
no, no recovery. So you can, and so I've drilled this, I've made my dowel, I put it, I'm, I'm confident. And now I've got this big bulky curved piece. I've got to come up with the, 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 um, the shape of the arm. And that's not going to work. I'm going to go here. And you're good. So I want to reference this portion. Actually, let's go back to it. When I have this all up, up on, uh, on the chair piece, um, I want to mark this arm where it's meeting here, reference to here and here, the top and the bottom of that joint. Okay. And once I have that, then I can match. Where am I? On that, I marked that. Now this thing is curved, bowed. So right. now we go to the bandsaw <laughs> and we cut this all out and we put it on. Once we have it all cut out and we're confident with the joint, sculpting the underside of this. Let's go back to this chair here. You can imagine sculpting this underside after the arm has been put on. Mm. <laughs> so you want to sculpt as much of this as you possibly can. This, no problem. This, no problem. This, no problem. It's, it's actually from, from down here with the seat, up the back leg, here and here. That's really difficult to sculpt when it's yeah. something. That's the reason I bought those little brass Preston sculpt shades. So you can get them <laughs> in here and do that. It can be done, it's just a challenge. Um, and once, once the underside of that is sculpted, you glue this up. Um, I use a uh, tight bond here, even though it's a dowel joint. I told you that I used uh, on, the, on the rocking chair sleds, a dowel joint, fluid dowel joint. Right. I use uh, epoxy, it's just because it, that's a stress point. There's a lot of stress there. And when you're fitting up the rockers, it, sometimes it's kind of hard. You need, to, you, know, you need to expand the hole a little bit in order to get it so that it all lines up. Yeah, and if you expand the whole tight bond glue is not a void filling glue, mm. epoxy is. Yeah. The other thing that you should know is that um, when you do do the joint in the back, there's a there's a screw that goes through, and so the screws are three inches long. I use fax screws, stainless steel screws, and so three inches isn't going to make it. Oh yeah. So I drill a hole about this deep <laughs> with, with um, just a regular um, 7 16 inch you know, brad point drill. And then I plow through it with the taper drill. And so rather than going to that line on the taper drill, I go deeper. This is a challenge. I mean, you can, I, and I, only because I've done this, I, mean, I know it can happen. <laughs> I've actually had a screw come out up here, you know. And so there's a chair in my home and I couldn't sell it. <laughs> it's got a little blemish mark where I, you know, chipped it out and I put in a patch there, you know, right. but I wouldn't fully really sell that. So you have to be careful that you got this angle oriented so that it's going down the mm. center of this and not what you would, you know, you have the tendency to want to screw up. Yeah, screw up. That <laughs> guy screwed up everything. <laughs> so, so this, this um, plug, it's a little bit different. The whole drill is a little bit different than yours. So, a little bit on sculpting, and we call it a day. Sure. I mean, I can go on. I can <laughs> I'll talk more than I have in a show. Sculpting the seat. I have a you know, test, tool, an, test tool angle grinder that I use. And um, I, I try a feather, I call it feather, and maybe that's the right term, I'm not sure. But I go outside, stay outside of my lines and I feather, keep on feathering. And you keep on going until it looks good to you, I guess. This part here, the pommel, you, you know, the pommel really should be shaped This, 
You want the pommel to be shaped. I'm going to over exaggerate this just to, so you can see it. Maybe that's not even over exaggerating, but you want it to be pointed in the center and six, seven inches at the back. Um, that kind of gives you this, if you look at this here, kind of looks like it's coming up. And, and what I do is I go about, so let's say three inches and three inches. And I, on the underside, I grind like this. I'm over exaggerating, and this is actually a straight line, straight line here. And then that grind goes all the way back six to seven inches or so here, and um, but it's at a triangle. On the underside, it looks like this. You follow that? And then once I have this shape, I file. And I'm over exaggerating this. I file a round over like that from the front to the back of that six inches on the underside. And if you feel on the underside of this here, that's what that is. And so it's just taking a, a file, or, or, you know, I've done this in the past, if you see these things. But the, uh, this one's too big, but it's the only Cheeseburger type thing. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, they're, they're quite effective for that. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I would either use a, a rasp or this. I, I don't use, um, when I'm grinding these angles, I use the, the um, disc grinder, but when I do my final work, it's always by hand. I don't trust myself with a machine, you know, I could yeah, dig in or something. So that's how you get that sort of um, turtle snout looking on the front of that, you know. <laughs> uh, these are band sawed out, because, you know, you want to make it so that it curved, curved down. I think that's pretty straightforward. Um, one, of the, one of the challenging sculpting parts of this whole chair is this joint right here. So um, this, uh, I do a small round over here. I, I uh, actually I have a special pencil that I use to mark things, but and this is an inch, but I'll do like a quarter of an inch or three eighths of an inch. I mark the same on the back side. You get the idea. And so I round over this to the center of the, the side, the inside, same on the back. And then this here gets a heavy round over. So that when you're looking at the bottom of the chair, the inside looks like that, but the outside looks like that. You following that? And that's the yeah. same thing. That's uh, the same thing on both these legs. On the back leg, um, the the contour of the bottom. If you were looking from the footprint up, you it, it kind of looks like a football. And that's too too skinny, but um, let me bring that out. It, you know, so you and, and so there's a line right up here that is rounded over, and this is rounded over to that. And and actually, if you want, you can look at this. Um, So you can see that it's a slight round over here, a heavy round over here that goes all the way up, even though it's skinny here and fatter up there, thicker up there. And then the bottom one, you can see, kind of looks like a football here. I can get a back the bottom. And you can also see that that triangular mark here, that got ground and then filed down to get that raised up. The, the, the tip of the pommel raised up. Now, like I said, the, the most challenging point is this right here, this joint right here, and, and um, I stress over this. Mm. Every time I do it, it's like, it's going south on me, it's going <laughs> south on me. And um, up on the wall, I have a Fordham uh, 
grinder, mm -hmm. familiar with Fordham grinders. Yep. And um, I use uh, Saber. <laughs> this is lo and behold, they have this little pantry crane in the shop here. Manufacturer, <laughs> whoever was building stuff in here, uh, making handles for knives and forks and stuff, I have this pantry crane. I don't know what they use it for, but I have these little garden hooks on it, and I hang my. <laughs> my Fordham grinder from that and I can move hmm. around around the chair and everything. Oh, cool. And, and I think these are Sabre. Sabre? Does that sound right? So um, this is what I use. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's almost reverse, huh? So uh, these are the grind. I, these are the only bits that I use right here. And uh, this is uh, to get into this joint. You want to um, take your grinder and shoot for having this seat part and the arm part on the leg part of it. And just keep on going up and down, up and down. Hmm. And you keep on doing that, and it's gonna look ugly as heck, man. It's gonna look like, oh, gee whiz, I really hmm. screwed up here. But it, you gotta take off a lot of material. I mean, look at, look at how much material you gotta take off in order to get, so that this is halfway between that spot now. How much oh, material yeah. you have to remove, and like I said, it's it's going to look ugly and ugly and ugly, and then all of a sudden, when you start getting it refined, it's going to whoa, mm. whoa, phew, man, it's it's okay. <laughs> I've made twenty or so of these chairs, and every single one of them, that's the part that I say, oh man, mm. I screwed this up, but <laughs> yeah. it, it works out. Um, sculpting. Uh, I, um, when I do do the round over here, the heavy round over, the light round over, and uh, the round over on the back, and uh, um, I pretty much do that by hand. My preference is to use um, spoke shades or a um, or, or rasp. And the nice part about the rasp, and somebody asked me this, what, why, why would you want to use a rasp when you can take up more material with a spoke shade? For me, I don't know if this is the same for everybody, but for me, when I'm using a rasp, and I, I never, I, I've never been taught how to use a rasp. <laughs> you, you would think nobody needs to be taught how to use a rasp, right. but I tend to go forward and down grain all the time. All in that, yep. I don't. Uh, right. And for some reason, for me, I get feedback from the rasp. And if, if I'm, if all of a sudden, like I can already see, there's some, you know, I didn't, I didn't do that. If I'm, I can feel that bump right there. Mm. You know? With a spoke shade, I don't feel that. I don't get the feedback from a spoke shade. Right. So I tend to take off a majority of the material with a spoke shade and refine with a rasp. Mm. Now, um, I don't use this for that kind of thing. <laughs> you know, it's too small. Um, <laughs> you can you can really work. all three wood with the grass that big. Um, do you use files at all after? Excuse me. Do you use files at all after raspin or do you go straight to send it? Uh, right to send it after that. So this is a, a thirteen. This is a ten. Yeah, ten. So um, yeah. I, I do use scrapers too, you know, so I'm not, you know, if I could get away without sanding, I'd be a happy guy. <laughs> yeah. If you know a person that loves to sand, I'm looking for an apprentice. <laughs> um, the, the one last thing I think that's worthy of sharing with your members is, uh, and this is um, you know, one of Colleen's iconic, um, signature things the, on the back of the chair. Now, usually, um, whether it's a walking chair, a high back chair, or, or this little back chair. Now, 
he made other kinds of chairs that he can use for things for. And this is this a lot of people think this is a bit of a challenge to make this here. Um, and some people call it beer. Some I've heard people call this a petite beer, and then sometimes a rocking chair, that beer goes way up here, but it's got this boom in it, and this is it. Hmm. That's it. You know, feather it into the back of the seat. And and you know, you can actually get a sander in there, a disc sander, you know, and sand that after the fact. If if there's a place where I can't get sandpaper to. And um, this is four this is brick. But I know that I can get my rasp into and wrap the sand like this. Hmm. Pause the video there. So I get kicked it. There we go. <laughs> so, so uh, just in case you missed that, and, and you know, this is not anything new uh, to anybody, but you know, I th I don't have a problem sanding like this, and this is one of the reasons why it takes. And the underside of here is hard to sand. You can't get you can't get a sander uh, underneath this unless you've got this big, you know, uh, <laughs> Merca, you know, two inch sander. Maybe you can get a little bit underneath here, but in any event, I tend to do this. And it, it does, it takes me about um, three days to sand one chair, eight hours each day before I'm happy with it. And then um, when I put the first coat of finish on, like I said, I've been using water lots last year or so. And I put the first coat on, I hit it with uh, 400 grit by hand, just lightly, make sure that any dust that's dropped on for the finish is removed before I put the second coat on. <laughs> and same with the, before I put the third coat on. And then when I put the wax on, final butcher wax, um, I uh, use Scotch Bright to put the butcher wax on. I let the wax harden, I let it sit, you know, it looks whitish. Mm -hmm. I let it sit for a bit and I can feel it, you know, you, you can kind of scrape it off. And then I buff it down with cotton rags. Mm -hmm. That's it. Awesome. I hope I <laughs> help somebody out and encourage somebody to, to uh, take on one of these chairs. Because, yeah. quite frankly, uh, uh, no, I, I I was intimidated by it um, uh, from the get go. I was like, yeah, this is this is going to be junk. You know, mm. I'm never going to be able to master this. Not that I need to master that one something new every day, but but um, I, I don't think there's any reason why anybody should be intimidated by this any more than making a. Uh, craftsman style chair, you know, a, a, a flat border type chair or something. Yeah. Um, the sculpting is really easy. Um, what I like to do to tell people when, when uh, I'm trying to sell the chairs and shorts and stuff, when it comes down to the final sculpting, I don't use my eyes. Your eyes are going to deceive you. Your eyes are going to follow right. the grain and they're going to say, oh, look at that, that grain's going that way, that's going that way. They're not the same. But if you close your eyes and you feel it, your hands don't lie. Your feel, you know, mm -hmm. especially if you're wearing two fifty, you know, cheer glasses. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in, in any event, use use your hands and feel it. And, uh, I mean, even this chair, I feel it. I'm like, yeah, I could have done a better job there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, hey, I hope that helps people out and encourages people to take one of these chairs on. If you guys email me and you're interested in. Um, in, in uh, templates or visiting or uh, ever want uh, a kind of do this, um, feel free to give me a call. Like I said, I'm retired. Cool. <laughs> and, uh, this is my hangout. It's not a hard place to come to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, next time in town, I'll give you a call. 